Amen. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, says that we would not want to be tossed to and fro by the waves. We would not want to be carried about by all these winds, different doctrines, human cunning, craftiness, etc. And the solution to whether or not we are blown about in a storm has to do with where our anchor is, just as we heard. Ephesians chapter 4, you may or may not realize we have been going through Ephesians um, off and on. We have spent some time in Ephesians back in May and June, and um, we are going to continue through Ephesians until we get to the end of the book, Um, And we'll do this in stops and starts as other things also are added to our Bible teaching time on Sunday mornings. Um, But we are picking up today in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 because last week we left off with the last verse of chapter 3. We're thinking this morning about what God says to us about unity. Unity. Remember this, and this will be sort of a, a, a mantra of sorts for this sermon, and and students, I think you might do this with me. One for all, and all for one. So you 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 stick your hands up for me. Y'all gonna be cool, and all these other people are boring, right? So students, right? So one, right? Do one. Good, good job. Good. They know how to do one. That's great. One for all. Big old fist, right? Doesn't that feel powerful? And then all for one. All right, anybody else not in the youth section want to do that with me? Probably not, maybe, we'll just try it. One for all and all for one. We're going to see in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 6 that there is one, Jesus Christ, who has brought salvation to all who believe. So there are many of us, there's one Lord, right? We're going to also see in verses 7 and especially verses 12 through 16... A second section where our job, all of us, all of us together, are to be living for one. So all, one for all, that is Jesus, for all of us. And all of us for one Jesus. Let's read thoughtfully about what God said through the mind and the pen of Paul to a church so long ago in Ephesus, but also to us today in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. He says, I therefore, Paul speaking, I'm a prisoner for the Lord, and I urge you, Ephesian Christians, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord. One faith. One baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he, held a, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And in saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth, and he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Verse 11 And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry. For building up the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and evil in deceitful schemes. Rather, 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 
speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is quit, the whole body, when each part is working properly, that this makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Again, one God for all of us. And secondly, it is now our job, all of us, for one, for him. Think for a moment, again, looking in verses 1 and beyond. Paul is encouraging them to walk in a manner worthy. Walk in a manner worthy. There's a way to walk and it's not worthy because you were called to something special, given something amazing, and there's a certain way to behave as a result of that. The way to behave as a result of that is that with all humility and gentleness that you would bear with one another in love. Bear with one another in love. Now y'all know how it is to bear with. If you're married, you really know how it is to bear with. And you know that you need to pray for my wife as she bears with. Bless her heart. Me. But we also know that in church, we're supposed to bear with each other. Now, bearing with each other might be of a, a booger bear of a, of a request and command from the Lord. But to bear with each other is to let it go is to shoulder side by side the thing that your brother and sister is having a tough time shouldering. Some of us are having a tough time and we need one another to bear up underneath that weight, that difficult thing. Now bearing with one another also needs to come with a couple of doses of other medicine flavors to add with this difficult to swallow, bearing with each other. Yeah, but Aaron, you don't know what they've done. I, I, I don't. But I'll tell you who does know. The Lord knows whatever they've done to you, and the Lord knows that they've also done something to Him. And He, Jesus, died for their sins in spite of what they did. And we are to bear with one another, but not just bear with one another. Well, I guess preacher said I was supposed to bear with, and they sure are a bear, and I wish they'd pull their claws back, and their breath smells like a bear, and they act like a gruff old bear, and I, well, Jesus told me to, so I guess I will. That's not what this text says. Friends, let's read it again in verse 2. It says we need to have some humility you know, sometimes bearing with one another remembers that you ain't got it all together either. And it's easy to point fingers at what's matter with their life so that you spend less time thinking about what might be wrong with your own life. Humility is to put others in front of yourself, their needs in front of your own. And being humble is, I'm not better than, I'm just with you. That's humility Bearing with one another with humility. Bearing with one another with gentleness also means kind things. Because if your words cut them while you stand beside them, then all you've do, done is add to their wounds. Gentleness is a balm that heals the cuts that life has brought at them or that their own sins have brought upon them. And kind and gentle things is a balm and an ointment and a medicine that eases the pain. And if you're going to bear with somebody with cutting words and an angry, frustrated disposition, you might as well not bear with them at all. Because gentleness means that you're bearing with them with some kindness about their situation. I don't think you'd have to spend too much time thinking about what might be going on in their life before you could begin to realize, you know, it might be tough on me if I were in their shoes. Gentleness helps you to do that. And that's the way you're supposed to bear with one another. Also, you're supposed to bear with one another with patience. 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 This is the bearing with one another that doesn't say, well... Yet again, mm, here it is. 
same thing as last time. Bearing with one another with patience knows that what they are struggling with may be something they always struggle with. And so if you'll help them bear that load, it'll take time. But what if, because of your patience, you never left their side. And as those things progressed, the two of you walking towards where Jesus was, you saw gradually, one step at a time, their whole life change. Because you were patient enough to not give up on each other. We give up on each other. We get sick of each other. We get annoyed at each other. Most of the time the problems within church unity is not because of serious, very difficult disagreements. Most of the problems we have in church unity are just annoyances. And that's why humility and gentleness and patience are of supreme importance in this. Because we never give up on each other. If we are going to bear with one another. How? In love. Because love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It doesn't get excited when things go wrong. This is the kind of thing love does. So if we really love each other, teenagers, I understand. I understand. You're in youth group with that one. Don't look at each other. Don't look at each other. You're in youth group with that one. And you look around and think, oh, did they come this time to youth group? I don't know if I want to show up. I understand. Because when Brother Mike says, hey, we got a youth thing going on. And your first thought is, who's coming? Right? Who's coming? Because if so-and-so's coming, I don't know. Can I, can I suggest, friends, that this says that we ought to have patience with each other and we ought to love each other and that it doesn't promise to be easy, but we are to be this kind of people. The youth group is to be this kind of youth group. The children's group is to be this kind of children's group. Every Sunday school class at this church is to be this kind of bear with one another. Everybody who walks in from any situation in any life in this place ought to feel as if they are loved by us. Now, lest you assume that I'm fussing at you, we came to this text in order. And honestly, sincerely, Raymond Road is one of the most loving and welcoming places above and beyond several churches that will remain nameless that I know. <laughs> And there are many of you who would testify, and, I, and listen, I've heard this testimony from many, many people, that I walked into Raymond Road Baptist Church and felt kindness and felt love and felt being welcomed in this place. That's a lot of testimonies from all of us. Can we think again, too, though, what is Paul saying to the church at Ephesus? Therefore, what's he saying to us? Paul has spent Ephesians chapter 1, 2, and 3 talking about how Gentiles and Jews don't get along. But in church, because of Jesus, everybody gets along. So there were two groups of people that did not associate with one another. And it comes from thousands of years of history of Jews doing things this way of Gentiles having any number of different things. Friends, the word Gentile is literally a word that means you ain't like us. It's all the non-Jews out there. The Jews had a word for everybody who was not a part of their group. That's what these terms are. Because of the glory of Jesus Christ and what he did, because of the cross, he died for the sins of Israel and Jews. He died for the sins of every other person on the planet. And Jesus can bring people together who have no business being on the same team. That's what Jesus does. But the church in Ephesus was still having struggles with unity. I'll say this. We are loving in this space, and you're to be commended because you're following Christ to be so loving and welcoming. But I'll also say that it breaks my heart that we have thousands of denominations in the United States. I understand why those things exist. But friends, there is one church of God. One church of God. And I understand that things have split over the years. And I understand the whys of this. 
I've been involved in difficult decisions that ask ourselves, has a sister church gone astray from the Bible, and are, what are we to do about that? There are times where Paul would correct Christians because they were saying things that were not true, that were incorrect, and he was correcting their things that were uh, their doctrines that had gone astray. He was doing things to do that. But his goal here in all of this was unity. We're to bear with one another in love. Look again at what he says beginning in verse 3. Eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. When Christians get along with each other, the Holy Spirit who's in each individual Christian. There's only one Holy Spirit. He's in every one of those hearts. That spirit unifies hearts. And what happens is they become connected in a bond of peace. And when Christians hate each other, they are proving that they are not following God in that way. When Christians argue in all caps against one another, they are breaking the heart of God who wants the Holy Spirit in each individual Christian, whoever they are, wants all of those hearts to be knit in peace into a single Peace that has been knit together. He goes on to talk about why this should be one. There's oneness because there's oneness in God. Look at verse 3 again. Eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. Eager to do this in the bond of peace. Verse, uh, or next verse there, verse 4. There is one body of Christ. One. There, mo- most churches that are Christian churches, you can walk in those churches and find some who God knows are actually not on Christ's church team. They're there, they're present, but their heart's not in it and they don't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in most of those churches also, you'll walk in and you'll find Christians in those churches, even in some of these other denominations. And we believe in the Southern Baptist Convention, we believe that we're trying to be faithful to what God says in his Bible. But we also believe that Southern Baptists are not the only ones going to make it to heaven. In fact, we also believe that it's possible for Southern Baptists to be dyed in the wool Southern Baptists, not make it into heaven because they don't have a relationship with Jesus. But there is one body of Christ. And when the church all over the world speaking many, many languages praises him every weekend, depending on what the, uh, the uh, time zone you're in. Every, all weekend long, there are people praising the name of Jesus, reading this book right here, and saying in their own native language, hallelujah and amen. I've been a part of those spaces. It was a mission trip on a foreign field, and I was amazed at how church there and church here is so much the same. Prayer. Bible, Jesus, preaching, teaching, and amen sounded the same in their language as it did in English. And hallelujah sounded the same in their language as it did in English. It was a beautiful moment to watch this. Because when Jesus returns for his church, he's going to find every individual all over this planet who believes in him, has a relationship with him, he's going to bring them to his heaven. One body of Christ. That the problem is not God. The problem is us. And, and again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we abandon our denominational affiliations. Because I do believe. I do believe there are churches who have gone away from correct doctrine according to God's word. But I'm also quick to, in a time of interaction with a Christian brother or Christian sister, listening for the Holy Spirit in their heart, evidence of God in their life, and a commitment to God in his word. And when I find those things, I know we're connected, and there's a unity that brings peace together with them. One body of Christ. There's one Holy Spirit. One Holy Spirit. And he inhabits anyone who believes in Jesus. He comes into their life. He changes them from dead in sin to alive in Christ. This Holy Spirit guides them to what the Bible says. This Holy Spirit shows them who they are supposed to be. It also says in this passage, we were called to one hope that belongs to our call. Do you know what every Christian all over the world is hoping in? 
They're hoping in the fact, the certainty, the rock-solid prophecy written in the Bible that says that Jesus is coming back and that heaven is their real home and this place, we're just passing through it as a foreigner in this country. So our greatest allegiance is not to this country. Our greatest allegiance is not to this government. Our greatest allegiance is not to our language. Our greatest allegiance is not to our culture. Our greatest allegiance is to Jesus Christ. Through the one Bible he gave us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. God the Father up there bringing us all into a single body of Christ church. That's, That's what God has built here in this place. And Raymond Road Baptist Church is a church in the church, if you understand. We are one group that's a part of a bigger body of Christ church all over the world. There's one body, there's one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. The hope of Jesus, the hope of heaven. One hope that belongs to your call. One Lord. We only serve one master. We only serve one that we give our greatest allegiance to. There's only one who's in charge of our life. There's only one that we are to bow before. Only one. The Lord God Almighty. Through his son Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Free in one. Friends, God has already shown us what unity looks like through his very nature. God is one God in three persons. The reason we have trouble with the doctrine of the Trinity is it doesn't make sense to us. That three is not three, it's one. Because one plus one plus one doesn't usually equal one. When we do math at school, one plus one plus one should equal three. And then we look at who God is. And then God says in Genesis, let us make man in our image. Because there's so much to who God is, you can't put him in just one. He is more than that, but he is one. Because he's not three. He's one. What? I know! You read the Bible, and there Jesus is being God, and there God is being God, and there the Holy Spirit is being God, and how do we reconcile that? We don't fully reconcile that, because our small brains are picturing a big God. And faith shows us that there's more to who God is than we understand. But you know what's beautiful about God is that he is one. While he is a completely unified, single one, there is God the Father and Son and Holy Spirit somehow only being one. So his doctrine of Trinity that shows us who he is also shows us how we're supposed to be as one body of Christ. In one Lord. This is, this is a mystery. This is difficult to understand. But this is what God did. God created this one body of Christ. Through sending one son. One and only son. As John 3.16 says. Sending one Holy Spirit in Acts 1.8 to do amazing miracles. And one Holy Spirit as scripture teaches us in every one of us who believes. And this gives us one hope in heaven. Through him and one Lord that we bow to, one faith, one belief, all brought together through his Bible here. One baptism, the great commission, Jesus himself said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There is one baptism we're supposed to use to add people into the kingdom of God. One God and Father of all One God is over everything. One God is through everything. When things that are small happen, it's because God made them happen. God permitted them to happen. One God happening through all of the things that happen. There's one God who is in all of us who believe. There's one God who's in all of his creation. There's only one. There's only one. There's only one. And he's here for us all. For us all. One For all. What do we do as a result of that? We are to be all for one. All for one. Look at verse 7. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Your gift of grace was a little bit different than my gift of grace. My gift of grace is a little bit different than some of your other gifts of grace. What does that mean? Well, 
talk more about that in a moment. Look at verse 11. God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherd teachers. He gave all kinds of different things to the church, to the people of God. Apostles. Apostles were those, especially the 12 disciples. These were those who, because of God's miracles through their life, because they were there with Jesus, taught by Jesus, and after Jesus ascended to heaven, they were there to represent Jesus to the world. In the book of Acts, the apostles were the ones sharing the gospel all over the planet. It went as far as Rome and Spain, as far as Africa, as far as India. The apostles spread the good news of Jesus all over this world. They had some special authority. The book of Acts shows Peter doing miracles, Paul doing miracles. Why? Because they were specially appointed by God to represent God to the world. And just as Jesus showed he was the son of God through what he did that couldn't be explained by natural means. The apostles also were involved in things that couldn't be explained by natural means. Now it's my personal interpretation of God's word that apostles are no longer with us physically here. There are some who would disagree with me on this point. But I believe that the apostles were there as examples in scriptures and all the apostles that there were are here in the book and that if somebody calls themselves an apostle now, I think they might be misunderstanding or misrepresenting some of what they might think is their authority. I think there are some who were there to start the church. And when Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter Rock. And on this rock, I'm going to found my church. Then I think there was some special apostolic authority given at a specific period of time. And I think God gave the church apostles. But he also gave the church prophets. Prophet doesn't mean it's going to rain tomorrow. And I predict it. It's not what a prophet is. A prophet is literally a megaphone. God said to say it. God said to the prophet. The prophet said it to the people. That's what a prophet is there to do. There are times today where someone hears the Holy Spirit of God say something. It'll always line up with the Bible, though. He'll, the, God will tell that person something. That person will be supposed to deliver a message to the people of God as a prophet speaking for the Lord. There are special supernatural moments where this happens. It doesn't happen all the time. But it does happen, and when it happens, God is speaking to God's people through the mouth, through the megaphone of the life of a prophet. And this prophet would be there to explain to the people of God what God is actually saying to them at that moment in time. God gives the church evangelists. You've already heard from one. On the first Sunday of our revival in October, Cameron Tate, our friend, and who opened up the word of God with us, he is an evangelist. There are others too. They know that their call from God is to literally not pastor in one space, but to give all of their life and all of their time to just telling people. Josh Horner is an evangelist if there is one. Am I right? He will preach the good news of the gospel to a stump if it'll sit still long enough. And I love that in him, sincerely. I love that in him because that evangelist, these people of God... We're given to the church as a gift. The shepherds and teachers. Now this is who I am. I'm just a little old pastor in the pasture. Explaining the word of God. And I'm not mad about what I don't have. Because God didn't give me everything he gave somebody else. And God didn't give somebody else everything he gave me. My job is just to do my job. Because Ephesians 4.12 literally says what my job is. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. You need a weed eater? I'll get you one. You need to understand a Bible verse? I'll get you one. My job is to equip you. You need somebody praying for you? I can do that. My job as a shepherd, pastor, as a teacher, explainer of the things of God, that my job is to give you any piece of equipment you need to do whatever God's told you to do. What has God told you to do? When you tell me what God's told you to do, my job is to help you do that job. Whatever that is. Share the gospel with a classmate, with a friend, with a a relative. Pray for you while you suffer. Because Jesus is with you while you're suffering and I want to bear the burdens with you. Those are the jobs of pastor, shepherds, teachers. To do those things. And all of these, evangelists, apostles, uh, pastors, teachers. All of these are to equip the saints. 
When God sent us a job, he also sent us what we needed to do the job. That's what God did in all of these different kinds of people that God sends to the church. To equip the saints for the work of ministry. Why? For the building up of the body of Christ. Until what? Until all for one. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God to what? To why? We're still going to somewhere else. To mature manhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Listen, friends, the body of Christ is growing. Now, I I do mean that it's growing, meaning somebody's saying yes to Jesus. And they're a new Christian, so we're plus one and growing. But I also mean this. That as long as you're breathing, you're not like Jesus. And you've got a little further to go down the road. So you need to grow personally in your own faith. As long as you're still here, there's still work to do for the Lord and ways to grow in the Lord. And all of us together, iron sharpening iron, all of us together are to help each other Serve the Lord. What's the measure? The measure is the stature of the fullness of... What do you mean? Jesus is here. We are here. And our measurement standard is up here. And we are to grow. And to grow. And to grow. Together. Together. With our faith in one Lord, one baptism, one body of Christ. Growing, 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 growing. Until we reach maturity. Until we're where Jesus was. Until we're the kind of person we're supposed to be. Until every part. Verse 16. From the whole body. Every part joined and held together by all these joints. God made the people of God. Romans and 1 Corinthians both list different spiritual gifts. Some of us are naturally, because of the Holy Spirit, talented at This thing and not that thing. I'm not talking about singing ability. I'm talking about spiritual ability. Those gifts listed in Romans and listed in 1 Corinthians are being. You ought to be doing this. This is right. Oh, just kidding. Now it's wrong. That's the world we live in. We live in a place that is teaching teaching us, teaching our kids, teaching our grandchildren. Teaching us that what used to be right actually now is wrong. And what used to be wrong now actually is right. That's what the wind's doing. That's what the waves are doing. But if we are together, unified in Christ, then we become more like Jesus. And we are rock solid against all of the winds and waves. In him, growing up into a single whole body, all joined together. And when it works properly, look at verse 16. When each part is working properly, mm, 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 mm. that's awesome. It makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. One of the measuring sticks we're looking for is love. Can we speak the truth and then get happy when they get sad? No, we need to speak the truth because we love. Can we just love and never tell them the truth? No, that's not fully loving True love is to tell tell the truth also. But speaking the truth in love, those things go hand in hand. And in that, we build ourselves. God builds us, sorry, into the body of Christ. One for all and all for one. Now, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You had a feeling I was going to bring up a movie, right? Captain America in one movie there. Of course, he comes from the comic books. He He makes a sacrifice because the bad guys have got the bombs and it's going to blow up the world. And he's going to he's going to single handedly be the sacrifice where he sacrifices himself and crashes the plane into a place of ice that's abandoned by all people. So he can save the world. Right. He's going to do that because one person is trying to sacrifice and save the world. And then when they throw him out of the ice, it's comic books, y'all. When they throw him out of the ice later, of course, he becomes a rallying figure and everybody joins together excited about Captain America, Captain America. Well, that's nice. I enjoy the movie. It's really kind of interesting. But let me tell you a better one. Here we were, self-destructive, dead in our own sins. And one man, one son of God, was sent to this world 
to remove all of the problems and to bring people together with God. And they thought they had it made together. They had, did not have it together. Jesus came, showed us the life to live, taught us the things to believe, and then he sacrificed himself on the cross for the sins of all mankind. And he proved to the world he wasn't just a man because on Friday he died and on Sunday they went to check on him and couldn't find him again because he had conquered death and conquered sin. This Jesus that we worship spent 40 days with his people, ascended into heaven. Why? Because the comforter was coming right after him. Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 and amazing things were continuing to happen. Why? Because God reconciled Jewish people who believed in him in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Old Contract. And he brought Jesus, the bearer of a new covenant, a new contract, the New Testament. And he brought those things together. And everybody on the world, no matter who they were born to, Jewish or otherwise, everybody in the world now has a chance to say yes to the Jesus who came to save their soul. What a glorious thing God has done on a grand scale that makes us sit back in amazement. And when God gives me my little job to help others with their little job, I can rest in Jesus that there's a whole lot of little jobs through a whole lot of Christians in one body. Serving one Lord with one Holy Spirit doing some amazing things that God wants done in this place. What a glorious thing God has done. And I want to be built up into growing in love to be more like Jesus. I hope that's your prayer for you as well.